And uh, I'm going to take some questions. Uh, but first, I want to just uh, show you um, a little bit of uh, a little bit of work that I've done. Um, I have been doing this for 38 years and have had uh, the pleasure to work on some some pretty big campaigns. Uh, I created the Energizer Bunny. Um, I created uh, the Jack campaign for Jack in the Box. I directed those spots and I was the voice of Jack uh, for 20 years, uh, as well as some things local to Southern California, like the helpful Honda dealers. Um, but I've worked on all kinds of stuff. And so just to give you a little, a little background before we get started, let me take you through um, just some work that you may recognize or you may be too young to recognize. But um, so in this, uh, can you see the visual of uh, three guys in a ballerina? Okay, well, I'm the guy with a circle around my head. Uh, this is 1985 and uh, someone told me that this perfectly captures 1985. Mullet, you mean? A uh, little, little mullet going on, some suspenders, um, yeah. So anyway, uh, that's me. I was for a shoot for public television, doing um, promoting a story <clears throat> about uh, ballet. And so uh, the photographer on the left, David Leach, and I and my art director, Rick Carpenter, we just jumped in and started dancing with her. And this actually touches on something that's super fundamental to uh, storytelling and interest. And um, since advertising is, is based on the idea of, of gaining interest, um, this is good to know. You can't communicate with anyone until you, until you have their interest. And so what makes something interesting? And the, the basic fundamental thing of what makes anything interesting is conflict. So, um, I mean, a great example is, uh, you know, the movie Titanic, if there's no iceberg and everyone just sails across the ocean, that's not a good story. And, and, and this, is, this has been true for ages. If Little Red Riding Hood goes to grandma's house and there's no wolf, that's a bad story. So to make anything interesting, you have to have conflict. Um, so this photo, if it were just the ballerina by herself, be okay, but not super interesting. And if it was the three guys uh, dancing like that, it would be a little weird. But throwing uh, someone who's formally trained in, in ballet and three knuckleheads on the set makes, for, makes it a little more interesting. And so one thing I really want you to take away is whenever there's any kind of storytelling, there needs to be conflict. So if you wanna make a commercial interesting or any content interesting, there has to be conflict. And conflict is, um, sometimes that's a hard concept for clients to swallow because they're business people and they're risk averse and they have MBAs. And when you tell them, you know, this commercial, we need conflict. They're like, I don't want conflict. I want everybody to get along. Can't we just say some nice things about our product? Why do we have to, why are you screwing this up? I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get in trouble if there's conflict. I'm gonna get emails from people. I'm gonna get called in by my boss. And so that's, that's a really difficult thing for uh, a lot of clients to wrap their head around. Um, before, <laughs> It's always been conflict that's the, that's the key to storytelling, but then later agents, uh, Shia Day, an ad agency that I work with, tried to brand it themselves and they call it disruption. So now everything is about disruption. And that just means that you have to differentiate yourself from everything else if you wanna get noticed. All right, um, at this rate, it will take 15 hours to get through this. So I'm, I'm gonna skip ahead to some things. Um, here's some really early work in a medium called print that doesn't really exist anymore uh, for public television. And this is what I did when I was a 23 year old. 
Um, in hindsight, the idea of um, making people hungry by talking about giving birth to a burrito probably wouldn't make that choice again, but I thought it was kind of clever at the time. Um, these images are from my junior portfolio. So I went to a ad school at night where they helped me put together a portfolio. So these weren't real ads, um, but this is just practice in how to, how to create conflict and be provocative. So after a few drinks, his date was all over him. Uh, I did work um, with Isuzu, created a campaign called The Liar. Um, that also predates anything you've seen. But um, this is at a time when Japanese cars were threatening Detroit. And uh, so it was kind of provocative to say that um, other Japanese cars were copying our Japanese cars. And uh, this campaign was based on the idea of um, lying, um, which was conflict. Who, who lies? You, you, usually advertisers boast, um, but we thought Isuzu has, is a tiny automaker very little budget. And so we had to do something provocative to get people's attention. Here's an ad from that campaign, a little TV spot. Behold, the Isuzu Pup, the lowest price truck in America, about $6. Buy a pup now and you can get 3.9% financing or 500 pounds of bananas. Why, I saved enough money to buy this island and all the fish. And are many, Kiki Bobo. Hurry, 3.9% financing or $500 rebate for in Zoom. So that's weird. Uh, but when you're a tiny brand like Isuzu, um, you can't go head to head with General Motors and Ford. Uh, you're gonna lose that fight. So you have to do something that differentiates you. So did a lot of uh, a lot of that campaign. All right. Um, okay. So for a um, little, little background uh, on me, um, I was, uh, I went to USC and uh, it was 1980 and I was just think about that for a second. That was a long time ago, but um, I was a finance uh, and economics major. And uh, I took a marketing class as part of the basic business curriculum. And in the marketing class, we had a week where we studied advertising. We got to make an ad, a, a print ad. And I really liked it. I really liked it. I thought it was, it's uh, like, it's problem solving. And uh, it's creative problem solving. And so after the assignment, I went to the professor and I said, I really like advertising. How, how would I get into advertising? And he said, uh, well, what's your major? And I said, uh, finance. And he said, uh, what year are you? I said, I'm a junior. And he goes, it's too late. And so that kind of put an end to my uh, advertising and marketing dreams. And uh, I took a job with Mobile Oil selling lubricants in South Central LA in a wool suit in the middle of summer, talking to dealers who had guns tucked into their belts. That was my territory. And um, I couldn't, I, it was awful. It was, it was horrible. And I quit and I had no job and I had to move from my apartment a single apartment, a studio apartment. And the guy um, who moved in said, uh, I'm uh, gonna throw a little housewarming party. Uh, you're welcome to come if you want. And his name was Bud and he was in advertising. And when, when I went to the party, I thought, oh my God, these people are so fun. Everybody's smiling. People in advertising and marketing like what they do and they're having a fun time. This is great. So I, I said, how do I get into advertising? And they said, depends. What do you want to do? You want to, be, you want to be a creative person who thinks of the ideas? Or do you want to be a suit? 
who kind of strategizes and deals with a client. I said, I, I think I want to do the ideas. And they said, well, you then go to school and put together a portfolio of your work. And so I did. And I, uh, there was no internet then. And so I carried this big case around with me with fake ads in it and literally knocked on doors because that's the only way you could meet people. And uh, so I, I found one agency and they were willing to give me a chance and they, they had a tiny account, the Mitsubishi dealers account. And, um, and so this guy gave me a chance and I went home, I was thrilled. And then I got a call and he said, I can't, I can't hire you. You have zero experience. So I'm sorry, I have to withdraw my offer. And I said, I'll work for free. Just let me come down, I'll work for free. And if I do something you like, then you can pay me. And so that's what I did. And I got paid $100 for my first day, which was a fortune. And, and then I started. Uh, and here I am, 38 years and about 700 TV spots and, uh, and radio and print and outdoor and digital and all kinds of things. Okay, um, let me just take you, uh, I'm, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but I'm going to show you some of my favorites and some things that I've done to give you a little perspective. So uh, Prince Tennis Rackets was a client and they were trying to figure out how to sell oversized uh, tennis rackets because that was the thing. In fact, um, there was a standard size and then Prince came out with a big size. And the idea was is that um, an oversized head gives you a bigger sweet spot. So if you're a recreational player, you have a better chance of hitting a good shot with a larger racket. And so I thought, all right, well, that's cool for recreational players. So does that mean the smaller the racket you play with, the better player you are? A little bit. So I thought, well, who, who, would, have, who would have the smallest racket ever? And so I uh, created, I wrote this spot for Prince. As you might expect. God has an awesome tennis game, perfect form with unlimited power. That is why he needs only this racket. You, on the other hand, Colin. would do much better with the extended sweet spot of the Prince Extender Thunder. <laughs> Prince Extender Thunder, the most powerful racket on earth. All right. So, uh, so God would have the smallest racket. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Prince didn't have the budget that Wilson and some of the other bigger players had. And so when you, when you don't have a big budget, you need to get people's attention. And it wasn't going to be just showing a, a pro playing tennis well, because that's very conventional. So we had to do something different. And uh, so we had God. And then we did uh, the print that went along with that went along with it. All right. Um, I did a campaign for Nissan when um, SUVs were a new thing. It was 1988, and there were no such thing as SUVs. And so uh, Nissan was coming out with one, and we needed to launch it, and we needed to explain. Well, not just explain, but make people want SUVs. Because if you're used to driving a car, why would you want to buy a truck? And uh, what, we do, what we know about human nature is, is that these, just about every purchase you make has some emotion attached to it. Humans are not completely <laughs> rational people. <laughs> okay. And so, and so to buy a Pathfinder, one of the benefits of a Pathfinder is that it gives you, um, it tells other people that you're an adventurous person. Even though you, there's a 99% chance that you'll never take it off road, it's a badge that says I'm adventurous. And that's why people buy Jeeps and, and other SUVs. It's a signal to the culture of what I stand for. 
People who drive Priuses want to send the signal that they're saving the earth. People who, people who drive Porsches want to send the signal that they're race car drivers. That's how they feel. It, it's not necessarily, it's not true, but that's the message, the emotional message, and the emotional benefit that they get from, from those signals. And so, um, so the idea was, we'll pick a real couple, put them in a Pathfinder, and have them drive from Chicago through Central America, through Brazil, through the Amazon, and end up in Rio de Janeiro. That is a product demonstration. And um, so we shot that over the course of six weeks. I really was in the jungle. We were shooting on 16 millimeter film with a small crew. And um, here's, here's a spot from that campaign. <laughs> This is the first time Wayampi Indians had ever been filmed. They had never seen red hair or anything like a pathfinder. Here on the equator, the air conditioner was a big hit. And I'm pretty sure they liked our music. But you know what? We decided we liked their music even more. So this was a fun campaign. Um, we got, uh, we really did this trip. A lot of us got dysentery, but we were on a schedule. So we would just, if, if you had to go, you just hung off the back of the truck while it was moving. The, uh, the Wyampi Indians that we encountered was just pure luck. We were trying to figure out how to, how to go through the jungle and, and meet the indig indigenous people and a guy at a restaurant in Brazil overheard us and said, uh, I used to be the liaison with the, uh, with the tribe, the Wayampe, but I got fired. So I'll take you to see them if you want. And so we went in 500 miles into the Amazon and this guy was leading us. And as we got closer, we could hear the brush and the jungle kind of rustle around us. And he said in, in Wayampe, he said, don't kill the white men there with me. And so that's how we went into this village. And um, that was kind of, it was, it was all real. It was pretty amazing. While we were there, the chief's wife was pregnant and hemorrhaging. And we offered to take the helicopter, to take her to the helicopter that was 500 miles away, where she was going to die. And the chief had to go up in the helicopter first because nobody there had ever been higher than a treetop. So we, we, we took his wife in the helicopter. Uh, we took the chief up in the helicopter. He okayed it. And then we took the wife to a clinic, saved her life, saved the baby's life. And, and then the chief wanted to thank us. And so they threw us this celebration they painted our faces with clay and uh, they served us, uh, it's, it's called manioc root, which is like a tropical potato. They chew it up in their mouth and then they spit it into a bowl and let it ferment. And then they offer it to us as a, as a thank you, as a, as a thank you for uh, saving uh, those lives. So- That's a type of alcohol, right, right Rick? It does. It ferments. It ferments into alcohol, but mostly it just tastes like human spit. That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. So um, anyway, that was the road to Rio. We sold a ton of Pathfinders and kind of kicked kicked off that market. I wish this was done in the internet age uh, because we could have had live streaming updates and whatnot. But instead, we just cut a new commercial every six every week to update people on where Kurt and Marty, our, our couple, uh, were. And then for print, we ran in, in all kinds of magazines and we, we did these spread pages that looked like journals. And so we, we had Polaroids inside and handwriting and talking about what they were, what they were doing and who they met and how they were getting along and how, how the truck was handling and all that stuff. So that was Road to Rio. Um, do, 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 
do, do, do, do, do, do, do. Uh, okay. Um, also for Nissan, uh, did a commercial in 1990 that um, it only ran once, but it was for a car called the Turbo Z. And this one was directed by Ridley Scott, uh, a very famous film director. And it goes like this. So I'm having this dream. I'm in a turbo Z. So that spot ran once on the Super Bowl and it never ran again because the uh, Highway Safety Association said, you can't show a car leaving the road. It had or all four wheels leaving the road and that promotes dangerous driving. So ran Rick, um, excuse me. This is so incredible, by the way. Um, Michelle has a very great question. It is, what are some important factors to come up with great marketing slash advertising ideas? If you could address that. Thank you. Oh, that's okay. So, all right. I'm going to, what I'm going to tell you, 90% uh, of people in the industry haven't quite figured out. All right. So advertising and marketing is just one thing. It's persuasion. That's it. It's it is it's not art. Uh, it's an it's an applied art. It's not a fine art. Okay, and so a way to understand it is is um, a sculpture is art. It can be uh, it can look like it can look like anything. Um, just trying to light myself here. Um, so fine art is fine art. You could crumple up, you could, you could, you know, squirt some ketchup on a canvas and call it art, call it avant-garde art. Okay. It doesn't have to do anything. It's just, it's just whatever, whatever you want it to be, it is. But advertising and marketing is applied art. It has to, it has to do something. It has to work. It has to persuade in the same way that architecture is applied art. You can't just make a building kind of look interesting. It has to function. It, it has to be shelter. It has to be shelter and the elevators need to work and there, it has to work. Sculpture doesn't have to work, but architecture has to work. A, a bridge has to span something so that people can cross it. And it has to do that for a very long time. Art is, okay, so first you need to understand that advertising and marketing are applied arts. They have to work, all right. So to work, to persuade, and this is where a lot of people get confused. It's, it's persuasion. Advertising and marketing are persuasion. It's not entertainment although it can be entertaining, but it, the work that it has to do is persuade. All right, so now how do you persuade someone? Well, if you have an MBA, you, you probably think that a recitation of relevant facts will do the trick as if it were a trial and you have evidence. You know, this cereal is, whole grain 
blah, 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 gluten. Like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna tell you facts and that will convince you and persuade you to buy this product. But humans aren't uh, rational, they're emotional. And, and we know that because so many of our choices are, are not rational, they're emotional. What we buy, how we choose to spend our time, all kinds of things. And we know that we can be persuaded with emotion. You know, a, a, a four-year-old girl can go to her parents crying and say, I just, I really wanted this doll for Christmas and then I didn't get it. And, it would, and my friend has it and I don't want to be, oh, please. All right, well, that's an emotional argument that will probably end up with a purchase of a doll or whatever whatever it is. And so most, uh, most persuasive messages are some mix of uh, rational evidence and emotion. You know, perfume is a category that's pure emotion. Um, beer is a category that's part, uh, part rational, like, hey, fewer carbs and calories, but also emotion, like, look at all the friends you'll have when you drink this beer. All right. So advertising is persuasion. Persuasion is usually a mix of rational information and emotional, some, some kind of emotional pull. And to do that, we tell, we tell stories. That's what, that's what advertising and content is. It's storytelling. There's only, <laughs> there's only one story that we ever tell in marketing. The story is this product, this service will lead to a better life. That's it. Only one story. And if you can think of any advertising that does not at its foundation offer a better life, speak up because I've never seen it ever. I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm actually very curious because there is that one story, right? You're just looking for that hot sell, getting some, evoking some kind of emotion. Where do you find, do you find that it's extremely difficult at times working with the sort of corporate side of it to find the right tone that meets the product? Is there ever a kind of a clash between the folks that are commissioning the work, like your client and yourself in terms of like finding the sweet spot of tone? to get that sell out there? Yes, <laughs> yes. That is, the, that is the nut of it right there. So typically the, the creative people, you know, the, if, if they went to school, well, the, the clients, they went to business school and they got their MBAs. And then the, the arty creative types, they were, on, they were at school, but they were like on the quad, they were playing Frisbee with dogs. And these two groups never, never saw each other, never went to class together, probably had some disdain for each other. And now in advertising, the, the guy with the MBA, the, the person with the MBA is now counting on these Frisbee playing morons to to take their hundred million dollar budget and make him look good. Holy crap, there couldn't be two more disparate groups that come together to try to make something. So um, yeah, so the people, the people with MBAs are taught a concept called best practices. So best practices is uh, you look at what's going on in your industry, study who does it, best and then you copy them because why would you experiment with something that could be bad when there's already somebody doing it best okay so that's not that's not good because of really fundamental um, precept of of marketing is that you have to differentiate yourself so if you're copying someone else 
you're not differentiating. You're not differentiating. Uh, I, I like to say that uh, consumers can't have a preference if they don't see a difference. And it has to be about preference because everybody makes a good product today. Everybody makes a, you know, you, you can get decent food from any number of places. You can get a decent phone. You can get a decent car. Today, there, there aren't, you know, clearly shitty products. Everyone's pretty good. And so if your message is just like, hey, here's five things you should know about this phone service, you know, this internet plan, the, <laughs> the, the, the clients are like, man, we nailed it. We told them five things that are good about us. And now they're going to remember that and think well of us. The problem is, is that everybody makes something good. So why would there be a preference for any one of you? To Toyota makes a good car, so does Honda, so does Subaru, so does Nissan, so does Chevy, so does Ford. So it's not enough to say, hey, our product's really good for these reasons, okay? There has to be, you have to have differentiation. And the other thing is, that um, companies will do research to see, uh, to tell people what they want to hear. Okay. Like, oh my, you know, we're going to spend a ton of money on this. We, we better ask our target what it is that they want. And so you could be making hamburgers or sneakers or phones or insurance, you know, auto insurance or anything. And you ask people, what is it that you want us to be? And so everyone does the same research and everyone gets the same answers. And so all the advertising looks the same. And so there's no differentiation. And it, you've just, you've wasted your money. The only person who, the only company that comes out ahead is the company with the biggest advertising budget because while their message is similar, like, hey, that's a great looking hamburger. Look at the cheese start, start to bend. And look how happy the people are who are eating it. And I relate to them because look at their hairstyle, look what they're wearing. And, and they have a slight advantage because they, they have the money to pound that message into you. It's not persuasion, it's just repetition. Um, but that leaves room for a, a smaller challenger brand to do something that's differentiated and interesting and, um, and upset those market leaders. So yeah, there is a very real conflict between uh, clients who tend to be um, you know, conscientious and rational and creative people who tend to be open and irresponsible and bringing those two groups uh, together. That's really what a creative director is. A creative director can go talk to the client and understand what their, what their business issue is and have the client feel like, okay, that guy gets me. That guy totally understands my business and what's going on. And then the creative director goes to the creative department and uh, talks to the open uh, but not very good at rule following creative people and, and gets them to believe like, okay, the creative director gets us. He totally knows where, and then you have to sort of negotiate uh, something that's palatable, palatable to both. And here's what's really important about that. You sell a client on a strategy. Okay. So for instance, um, this, here's a spot coming up. Um, so the Energizer, the uh, Energizer batteries. And so you do a bunch of research and, and it's obvious that the only thing people care about in batteries is how long they last. They don't think about batteries until their flashlight doesn't work or whatever, okay? And so, so you gain the, the client's uh, trust that you understand their business issue. 
And if you get them to sign off on, we will demonstrate long lasting, because that's what people care about. If you sign off on that strategy, then that leaves us free to do whatever we want creatively to convey that strategy. And so here's an example. So uh, Energizer um, signed off on the lasts a long time. And then uh, I thought, well, if it lasts a long time, it would be, it would last way longer than you were able to show in one 30 second spot. And so I created a campaign where their logo essentially just keeps going and going and going. Don't be fooled by commercials where one battery company's toy outlasts the others. The fact is, Energizer was never invited to their playoffs because nothing outlasts the Energizer. They keep going and going and going and going. Daddy, Daddy, no, I promise. Oh, my sinuses. When sinus trouble strikes, reach for nasatine. Only nasatine has fast-acting mucinol. Watch as nasal... Like we said, nothing outlasts the Energizer. They keep going and going. The painting, Renoir. The vase, Ming. And the wine, Chateau Marmoset. One only the best... Still going. Nothing outlasts the Energizer. They keep going and going and going and going and going to brush. Oops. <laughs> um, so that was one 60 second commercial um, made to look like three 30 second commercials for different products. And the batteries last so long that it just keeps moving into the next, it can't be contained in one spot. And and the, um, the other part of it was that the longer this campaign runs, the more we're able to show that, it's, that it lasts a long time. So in year one, we established the idea of nothing outlasts the Energizer, it keeps going and going. And year five, it's still going. Year 10, it's still going. And so we keep proving the, um, we keep demonstrating what's important in batteries basically forever. Yeah. So, um, and that's tough because batteries is a low interest uh, category. It's not like beer or pizza or headphones. Insurance. Yeah, no one gives a shit about batteries. We were able to, we were able to, um, make people have a preference because uh, when they're in the store and you're at the checkout and there's batteries and there's energizer, there's the bunny battery and then there's the copper top battery, all things being equal, I'll go with the bunny. And that's what people did. So we were able to create a preference. And that went on a very long time. <laughs> we had a couple of questions here, Rick. Um from a couple of the students here. One was from Blessing. It has to do with diversity. Have you seen a lot of change in diversity and in inclusiveness over the years in, in marketing? Yeah. Or have I seen it? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the question you got to like, oh, have you seen, have you seen that like change over time, essentially? Well, I was at an agency uh, called Shiat Day and the founder, Jay Shiat, in 1988, started a uh, fund to try to uh, bring diversity uh, to the ad industry. And um, how can I put this? When we, when we look at people's work, we have no idea what color their skin is. We know nothing about them. We just, we see a, a reel of work and we wanna hire people who do the best work. Um, I think, you know, my agency has gotten more diverse because uh, so many of um, 
my client's customers are Hispanic. And so we do all the advertising we do, we, bo we do both in English and Spanish. But that's not in the interest of diversity for diversity's sake. That's, that's for competency. I, I need really smart people who, who speak Spanish so they can persuade Spanish speakers. And um, yeah, so it's hard. Why would you hire why would you hire someone who is not the most competent? That's the question. I hire, and if you hire the most competent people, it's, it's very likely that you'll get diversity. But this is, uh, there's a difference between causation and correlation. So when, when the US Olympic team at the start of the Olympic games marches into a stadium, you look at it and you go, wow, the, this team is incredibly diverse. And they're, um, it's an amazing team. The US is likely to win the most gold medals every time they enter the Olympics. That's correlation. The team that, is, that has the best athletes is also very diverse, but it's not the best because it's diverse. That's causation. So we could put, you know, we, if we said the US, the US basketball team should be diverse, we could do that, but we don't do that. We, we hire, we want the best players, however that turns out. And we want the best gymnasts and we want the best Whatever, weightlifters, swimmers, boxers, archers, whatever. And so diversity is, a, it, it's, it is a result, but it's not, I think today people think it's, it's a goal, but you're confusing correlation with causation. Does that answer someone's question? All right. You can probably move forward. Yeah, I think that's a good answer, though. I mean, you answered pretty well. I think there's one more it's question not... here, by the way. Sure. Don't mind, Rick. Yeah. It's from Ignatius. Uh, do you think marketing, the marketing department is necessary for a company? And what's your perspective of Tesla not having one? <sighs> well, there aren't too many Elon Musks running around. So I would say if uh, it works for Elon because he is his own marketing department. But I don't think um, if you're, uh, I don't know, if you're Ford, I, I don't think you can, I don't think that works for you. So. Elon is the exception to the rule. And for a while, Starbucks was the exception to the rule. Their thought was our stores are, are advertising. You, you can't walk a hundred feet without seeing a Starbucks and understanding what we do and why it's good. And, and so that was their marketing effort. They've softened a little bit on that more recently as more competitors have come in and, and they, do, they do do a little advertising, but yeah. So Tesla is the exception uh, to the rule. There's a cult following around Elon. If he likes something, lots of people will follow him. That's super rare. Do you think there's some kind of correlation with, you'd mentioned before, there's that uh, sort of cognizant association with certain things right like a porsche as a race car driver somebody who drives a uh you know the most expensive car is projecting the image that they clearly have the the, way, the means to afford it assumingly right yep do you think there's a similar correlation with people that want to follow that same train of uh affiliated i will call it sort of um social gravity if you will things that elon musk associates with because 
he's regarded as possibly the smartest person alive and that some people might think like oh that must make me something different as well yeah of course you know we're so we're social animals we, we don't exist by ourselves and and this is true throughout cultures throughout history uh you you might you know, in the Amazon, you signal your status and where you belong in the hierarchy of people with, with the, you know, what you have, your, your, your body markings, your piercing, a feather, whatever. And, and that's true for pretty much every culture throughout the world. We send signals to each other and to, help, to help other people understand where to help, to help us promote where we stand in the culture. That's been going on forever. And we've moved on from, uh, you know, for some people, it's how many bands around your neck. And for other people, it's the watch on your wrist and so on and so forth. You know? um, I, I'm so sorry. I just wanted to go back to my diversity question. I think it was posed sort of incorrectly. I wanted to ask, do you see an influx of like people of color applying for these positions? Given what, what you both have just talked about, about social capital and trends and influence, black culture has been one of the leading influence of popular culture. If you look at streetwear and all of these things, mm -hmm. have you seen a correlation with that influence and um, people participating in the, I, I would call it the back end of marketing, the creative direction, yeah. the suits and stuff like that. Yeah. So there has been, um, I would say for three decades, there have been agencies that are, uh, identify themselves as urban agencies or ethnic agencies. Um, Spike Lee started one. And so, that has been around for a pretty long time. Uh, and their argument is, is um, you, you, need, uh, you need people of that culture to be able to speak to um, your, your target. Okay, and that's true for Hispanics and it's, um, and so that's been around a while. What I have seen change is in the last year, I've seen, I've seen more uh, people of color dominating mainstream marketing and advertising. And so two years ago, if you were going to um, show a family that was shopping at Ikea, then uh, who, who knows now, guarantee it's going to be, it's going to be people of color, mixed race covers of magazines, they're, they're, all these companies are feeling the pressure and they do not want to become the target of activists uh, who make a claim like, I'm not seeing enough people of color and we're gonna organize and, and threaten you or boycott you. So I've seen a lot more, uh, a lot more diversity in marketing and advertising and I think that the, and I'm sure that the, the agencies that identify as um, ethnic or black agencies are getting way more phone calls than they were, you know, five years ago. I understand that you're saying you're seeing more representation as in like models and actresses. Yeah. I'm just asking from your perspective, have you seen that reflected in the people who are pitching these ideas, the people who are making money off of directing these ideas? Have you seen that reflected in the, in the crew, I guess? I guess yeah. that's a better way to say it. Yes. So there is, um, for instance, because there are so many more uh, black actors, there is um, a, a, a huge surge in demand for uh, makeup and hair crew members who specialize in that. And I'm I, so sorry for cutting off. And as far as agencies creating it, I, um, I'm not. I don't. Have, I'm not personally aware of it. I sort of uh, because I'm my own entity, 
but I would be, uh, I would bet that just as, you know, 10 years ago, any agency that had digital in the, in the title uh, was sought out because it was a brand new world and digital advertising was, was what everybody wanted. And now the, the word is diversity. And so agencies that, that have diverse uh, staff are also being sought out. Okay, that answers my question in a way. Um, thank you. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, I'm not going to talk about the future uh, because I tried that once um, in uh, in 1988. Jay Shiat pulled people from all over uh, different offices of Shiat Day, and he wanted to know what the future of advertising looked like. And so uh, every uh, two months, the group of 30 of us from different offices would meet and talk about what the future of advertising looked like, and um, we got it partly right. We said that um, how, how companies, um, companies who are good citizens uh, and uh, conscientious, there will be a move towards that that will be valued. And um, that has certainly come to pass. But then we missed the, the biggest thing ever, which was the internet. Nobody could predict, nobody predicted the internet and how that would affect um, advertising. So um, rather than try to predict the future, I'm trying to talk about things that are universal and forever. People, um, people want a better life. Uh, companies want to sell their products and to do that, they have to show how they're different and better. And as humans, we want to, yeah, we want to signal each other about what's important to us. That's not going to change. The tools always change, but people don't. It's kind of like, it's kind of like dating. You know, there's online dating is prevalent. So that's a tool that people didn't have 20 years ago or 40 years ago or 80 years ago. So that's new, but dating hasn't changed. People, the, the fundamental idea is that people want to meet other people and have relationships with them and have sex and have companionship and they don't want to be alone. That, that is going to be true for the next thousand years, even though the tools about how we achieve that will change. And so it is with advertising. The, the tools are always going to change, but the fundamental ideas of uh, companies need to sell things to be in business, that's not going away. And people uh, want things that make their life better. That's not, that's not going away either. All right. um, we're coming up here on uh, Jack in the Box. Um, these are the uh, initial kind of conceptual drawings of what Jack might look like. Uh, this was 1988, 89. Jack in the Box had just killed six people with E. coli in Seattle. And killing customers is not good for business. And so they held um, an agency review and wanted to climb out of this death spiral that they were in. And so um, I came up with an idea where um, they'd always had this clown be the speaker box that you would uh, order through. 
And so uh, I thought, well, what if, what if Jack were more than a speaker box? What if he was, you know, he's the founder of the company and he's come back to uh, shake up management, get rid of the incompetent people and start things fresh. And so um, that is what we did. This is the very first Jack in the Box commercial. And I'll just play it and I'll talk a little bit about the strategy. Hello, I'm Jack, founder of Jack in the Box. Perhaps you remember when I was fired. Ever since that setback, I've had to one day regain my rightful place as head of Jack in the Box. Today, thanks to the miracle of plastic surgery, I'm back and ready to make Jack in the Box better than ever. Right. Oops. Hello, I'm Jack, founder of Jack in the Box. All right. Encore. <laughs> An encore. Yeah. So um, I directed Jack in the Box, and I was also the voice of Jack uh, for 20 years. So I was, I was pretty close to this character. But here's this. Here's a the strategy um, behind this. So. It's not the first time that a company has gotten into trouble uh, and had people get sick or die. And so you're in crisis management mode. And the question is, how do you handle a crisis? Well, there's three, there's three things that you can do. Most, you can ignore it. That's one thing, but people are always, they're gonna have questions and it's gonna look like you're hiding. A more recent trend is to be uh, transparent. Transparent is a word that a lot of people love. They think that's a virtue. And so you would get your CEO to uh, address the public and say, we are, uh, you know, we recognize that this is a tragedy and we are doing everything we can to ensure this doesn't happen again because we care about our customers and our people. Um, that's, our first, that's our first priority uh, now and forever. Thank you. Okay. So that would be the sincere transparent approach. The problem with the sincere transparent approach is that it begs more questions. When did you start caring about your customers? Why didn't you care about them last week when you killed them? What exactly are you doing that's going to make sure this doesn't happen again? Well, these are all questions that you can't answer. I, I, I don't know why we killed them. We, I guess we didn't, whatever. It's not good. And so Jack in the Box, on its face, it just looks like there's a funny guy and uh, we'll take people's minds off the tragedy. But the strategy is we're going to, we're not going to ignore the problem and we're not going to look sincerely into the camera and say, we are so sorry, this will never happen again. These aren't our values because that invites more inquiry. We're going to lightly touch on it. We're going to acknowledge that uh, something bad happened we have gotten rid of the people responsible in a funny way. We blew up the boardroom. We didn't really kill people. We didn't really kill management, but it kind of looks like they're gone. And so we're walking this fine line where we acknowledge something that something happened, but the press can't have an interview with Jack Box and say, what safety precautions are you taking now that you didn't take six months ago? Because he's a fictional character. So we were able to acknowledge a problem in a humorous way. And people actually gave us the benefit of the doubt and said, all right, it looks like they're under new management. We'll give them a try. And so, um, and then here we are 400 Jack in the Box commercials later 
At the time of the tragedy, their stock dropped to three dollars a share, and um, and then it it uh, closed at ninety nine, uh, like five years into the campaign. So, um, crisis dealt with. Here's a couple of spots. Take a good look at my new 199 breakfast jack combo. You get golden hash browns, the original breakfast jack, and a big orange juice. But why juice and not coffee? For the answer, we volunteered Gary Kepler, one of our interns from Arizona State. First, coffee. Lots of pain. Now, juice. Feels nice. Thanks, Gary. Keep up the good work. Was that a McDonald's, Jeff? Or was that before the McDonald's incident? That was right after the McDonald's, my coffee is too hot. Brilliant. And so what we, what we did was uh, we, had, we didn't have the budget that McDonald's did. And so we had to narrow, we had to pick a target because McDonald's wants everyone from age you know, five to 95 to come into their restaurants and they have the budget to reach all those people, but we didn't. So we focused on the people who ate the most fast food and not surprisingly, men between the ages of like 17 and 30 eat a way disproportionate amount of fast food. And, uh, and what do men of that age like? They like irreverent humor. If they liked, you know, if, if, if they liked something else, then we would do something else, but they like irreverent humor. And so this helped us uh, kind of differentiate um, the, 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 the humor was something that was not happening in the industry. The industry was mostly 90% um, food and the target audience enjoying it. And the music of the moment, wardrobe of the moment, hairstyle of the moment, and, and your target enjoying it, the end. So Jack in the Box had to, to differentiate themselves. So there's Jack. And these spots were about 70% uh, story and 30% food. And so that differentiation helped them uh, climb back. There's 400 spots. <laughs> um, That's it. That's his house. <laughs> Mr. Brad Haley. Relax. Did I win something? My sources tell me you've been calling Jack in the Box junk in the box. So? I take these things personally, Brad. Get lost. Sure. Just try my food, apologize, and I'll go. <laughs> Jesus, clown. Listen, punk. I spent millions of dollars improving my kitchens to make our best burgers ever. You're psycho. <laughs> just your food, man. I'm sorry, Jack. Well, I'm sorry about the grass stains. Really? No. You run pretty fast, Rick. What's that? And you run pretty fast. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't actually in the head. Uh, yeah. Um, so here's an example of if, if you nail the strategy, you have license to do whatever crazy stuff you want. That's how you bridge the gap with a client. And so their strategy, th their problem was, we've made all these changes to our restaurants and people still think our food is crap. So how do we tell them that, that they need to give us a try? You know, we've, we've made changes and they should give us a second chance. And so we came up with this kind of cops thing and people would ask me like, how the hell did you convince them that a guy could call Jack in the box, junk in the box, and then the, the logo of the company goes and, and tackles a customer to the ground? And the answer is, is because it's on strategy. We, we get to say, 
rational things like I've changed my kitchens and we've got this new stuff and how does this taste and taste. So as long as it's on strategy, that's that's your door into doing, you know, interesting creative. All right. What else here? Mm, oh, while we're on Jack in the Box, here's something um, that I think is also pretty important. So Jack in the Box uh, is still running uh, 30, 30 years later. Uh, the uh, Energizer Bunny is still part of the campaign 30 years later. Um, my, work, my work for Honda is in its 12th year. That's unusual. Um, I believe in long campaigns. Uh, and that, that bucks the trend because um, a lot of people in advertising, well, first of all, creative people always want to do something new. I got, I got my own vision and my own dream. I want to do this. But a, a, a campaign that lasts a long time, it accrues value over time. So even though McDonald's would outspend Jack in the Box five to one in, in any given year, Jack in the Box would have like 10 years of the same campaign that was you know, taking up space in people's head. And so we sort of, we could gain ground on, on McDonald's because we had a campaign that had you know, $500 million behind it consistently. So that's one reason. It's like, so the campaign, it, it builds value over time. A campaign that changes every year because the, the client wants a new shiny object or the agency wants a new shiny object, that's like renting versus buying a home. You're renting. The advertising is an expense. It's, it's this celebrity and it's this shiny object and then it's this film technique and it doesn't build to anything over time. I have no idea what Pepsi's campaign is. I have no idea what Toyota's campaign is. Every year, you, it's just an expense. The Jack in the Box, they're building something over time that has value. That, that's an investment. That's an asset, not an expense. That's a huge, hugely different way to approach uh, marketing. Would you say that a campaign that sort of transitions with each zeitgeist shows a level of confidence that? that the company has for the campaign itself? Did you? you yes. Up a little bit. Oh. oh, yeah. So to do that, you have to, you have to give them an idea that has legs. And, and um, so you have to create a world where like, of course this can run digitally. Of course it can be a bumper sticker. Of course it can be POP at the window. The idea is that we're getting a, a behind the scenes look of the founder of this company. What he does at work, what he does with his family, what the issues are, that's interesting. And that, that can last a long time. And in the meantime, like, I don't know what, you know, Burger King thought enough of it that they kind of ripped us off and created the king. Um, but he doesn't speak, so it's a little more limited. And it's kind of terrifying. He's a little creepy. He's a little creepy. Um, yeah, so, I mean, literally, I... One I, of my competitors says you can have it your way. Really? Good luck ordering breakfast after 11 a.m. Let's talk about my way. Yeah. My way means you can order anything on the menu any time of day, whether it's a burger for breakfast or French toast sticks at midnight. Other places won't let you do that. And hey, if I'm saying something that's not true, do something about it. Okay. Joe's little, Jack is a little brotastic there. All right. Um, Oh, here's something just to shake things up. 
Okay, what's going on? Well, I think our new turkey bacon cheddar grilled sandwich is the best. And I think our grilled deli trio is the best. But the turkey bacon cheddar has roasted turkey, cheddar cheese, and bacon. And on Tuesday the 20th, it's free with the purchase of a... Let me stop this here. The client wanted to convey so much information. These two sandwiches, the attributes of these two sandwiches, the deal that's coming up, like, holy crap. There is so much information here. There is no way that this is gonna be interesting to anyone. So we did this, all right. Lots of information. Drink. Uh, yeah, same for the deli trio. And it has salami sliced ham, turkey, and provolone cheese. This is the worst commercial I've ever been in. We could kiss. Come in Tuesday, October 20th and get a free grilled sandwich with the purchase of a large drink. All right. Breaking the fourth wall, Jack talking to camera. Anyway, um, this is the one time that I was actually in the Jack head. Um, it was, you, uh, Jack was portrayed by an actor named Jack, which made things really easy on the set. Um, you can stay in the head for about 20 minutes before you start breathing your own carbon dioxide and you uh, faint. Uh, there's a very tiny lipstick camera at the end of Jack's nose that's pretty much invisible. And you're wearing goggles uh, inside, uh, virtual reality type monitors. And uh, because I needed to, because Jack needed to talk in real time in this spot, and uh, I was the voice, I had to get in the vehicle and uh, speak. And it was about 100 degrees, and I'm wearing a turtleneck and a wool suit, and we're turning the air conditioner off because it's making a sound. And we started, uh, Jack, uh, Jack was driven around, and you'll see what happens. Road trip. Three egg McMuffins, please. Breakfast is over at 10.30. Oh, so I can't get breakfast now? So what's the deal? We can't get breakfast now? No, we don't have any breakfast, sir. Why do you stop serving breakfast at 10.30? I don't know. We do, that, we do that every day. If you came to my place, I'd serve you breakfast. 24-7? Sure. Hey, do you know any place that serves breakfast now? Bagabot? Yes. <laughs> okay. So, um, one, you know, one clear idea Jack in the Box serves breakfast after 10, uh, 10 a.m. and uh, our competition doesn't. And, uh, you know, like a long campaign is sort of like episodic storytelling. You want people to be familiar and like the characters, but to keep it fresh, you have to put them in new situations all the time. And the beauty of, of having uh, Jack as a spokesperson is, is we see him, there's nothing that's out of bounds. We see his life 360. So there he's at work uh, going to the competitors and asking what's going on. And here he's uh, like after hours recreation. Rob, I'll get right to it. You're great. And I want you to lead the chicken team. Your first order of business will be my chipotle chicken ciabatta sandwich. Your choice of a spicy crispy or grilled chicken breast with a chipotle sauce served on lightly toasted ciabatta bread. Thanks, Jack. Pick the right guy. I am your chicken man. Oh. Rob, oh. you got the job. Oh. Cool. Rob, Oops. I'll get right to Sorry. it. You're great. And I want you to lead the chicken team. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, one question I have for you, though, Rick, is... Yeah. The smoothie commercial. <laughs> the smoothie commercial? Yeah. What was... Uh -huh. uh, that was you, right? In, in the commercial, right? This? Yeah. No, I mean, I wrote it, but... Uh, I'm not okay. in it. Okay. <laughs> Who, which which of those characters do you think? You I, know, I, I was I was under the impression somebody I wrote a read a 
blog that said it was you. So I looked at it a second time. Wait a minute, it's not you after all. <laughs> I feel dumb, but okay, it's all right. <laughs> Wait, the the guy who's twenty five years younger than I am, or the really fat guy? Be <laughs> the latter. <laughs> oh. oh my god! Ouch! Ouch! All right, let me. Uh... This is one of my. Uh, this is one of my favorites. There's a little foreshadowing in this storytelling. Hey, I got your email about saving money, and I was really touched. I'm on a kind of a tight budget, so it's really cool that I can get your new nacho cheeseburger or chicken sandwich with spicy jalapenos for just a dollar forty-nine each. Most of the money I say is going to a college fund for this guy. I'm gonna be a psychiatrist. And the rest goes into my monkey spaceship. Gotta follow your dreams, right? Mm -hmm. Not always. So is it the suits that are kicking down these specific sales points that they want to hit? Like with the uh, selling breakfast after 10, 1030, things like that. Is that where, from where within the totem pole is that getting kicked down into the pipeline? Well, I think it, it helps if as an agency, um, you're able to say, uh, look, you guys know your business better than we do. So if sale, if there's an opportunity to pick up sales against your com competitors, we believe you. And what that allows is for us to say, uh, we do advertising. And so just as we defer to you when it comes to operations, maybe you should defer to us when it comes to creative messaging. You don't actually say that in front of them, but that's the relationship of like, okay, you guys, and it's true. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to say that I know the fast food industry better than you do. So give us a problem, but don't give us a solution. And, and that builds a lot of trust. You know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of mutual respect there. Um, I, I want to, just move on to two spots for Southern California Honda. Um, this is also uh, for 60 years, dealers have been selling cars the same way. And uh, we said to this group of dealers who are very successful, uh, you don't know this, but everybody hates you. Uh, you walk onto the dealership lot and everybody loves you. Hey boss, how's it going? Great, you look great, lose weight, whatever. But people who actually buy cars hate going to dealerships. They think they're gonna get ripped off. So what you need to do is completely change your image and have people love you. And then all things being equal, the car, you know, your competitors, cars is good and the prices are relatively the same. All things being equal, they will prefer Honda because they will expect a better experience. And so we created the helpful campaign where we uh, surprise people with random acts of helpfulness. We, we shoot it, we put it on TV and social media um, ha has been a huge part of this because you help someone and then they tell their 900 friends and then those friends tell more people and then we're able to generate um, PR the, you know, when, when we do events, they're hungry for content. And so we get all the TV stations to come out and show us giving away free gas. And so we've been able to change the image of Honda dealers from most car dealers who we think are assholes to heroes. And, he, and here's a, a couple of spots that show this uh, sort of random act of helpfulness while still having a retail message. You came in for the oil filter and the battery, and then we did the timing belt. No. We also went ahead and did two new tires. No. Brake fluid exchange. I only get him for battery. Um, it's free. Free? Oh. It's a random act of thoughtfulness. Shut up. Are you serious? Today, we helped Honda drivers with a free upgrade, and during the Honda Dream Garage Spring event, we can help you too. You can lease a 2018 Civic LX for just $189 a month plus tax, and the Civic is KBB.com's 2018 Best Buy Award winner among small cars. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's just my job to be helpful. 
And then, so after, for the oil filter. and so after running this, um, after running this campaign for eight nine years, people understand like, oh, when, you know, Honda guys are helpful. When a Honda guy shows up, something good is going to happen. And so then we, uh, a couple of years ago, we heard about a uh, school for the deaf that needed su supplies. And uh, so we went there to give them supplies, but um, I decided I'm not gonna have any sound or subtitles to this spot because they're unnecessary. The, the silence will stand out from everything else on TV. And we know the story. Honda guy comes, surprises people, helps them. So there, there's no need for subtitles or, or any sound. Well, I like this. Differentiation, standing out. You can't persuade people if you don't have their attention. Um, uh, and so that's, that's an example of that right there. All right. I think this time has gone way faster than I, uh, than I thought it would. Um, so if there are questions, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have or comments or anything. Feel free to uh, ask one at a time or go ahead and type them out in the chat. I know a couple of you wrote one earlier. Uh, there was a question from one of the students overseas, I believe. Let's see, do we require branding to do a... Is it required that branding comes before big marketing and advertising? But it sounds like it looks like here. I'm not too sure, but... Um, I'm going to say yes. You got to decide what your brand is going to stand for before you spend a ton of money uh, promoting it. So uh, BMW has decided that they're the ultimate driving machine. So that's good to know before you go out and spend hundreds of millions of dollars. So yes, I, I would say, and it, and it ought to be what you stand for it's it's really good if it's um, true, but if it's not true, it's really good if it's believable. Um, and so Honda dealers are kind of like other dealers, except that we actually do go out and change people's lives and help them in big ways and small ways. Um, but I think, the, so the answer to that question is, um, it's good to figure out what you stand for. Um, the Ritz Carlton, every employee at the, at the Ritz Carlton has a card inside their pocket that reminds them of what the brand stands for. And it says, um, uh, <laughs> why am I, I've, oh my God. <sighs> Shoot. Uh, it's something like, um, oh, it's, it's ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so once you have that as your overarching mission, then you know what, your, uh, what the uniforms are going to look like and what the furniture is going to look like and what your facial hair policy is going to be and the thickness of the cardstock. Once you have an overarching idea, then everything falls from it. So once you decide you're helpful, well, then you know, you know how to operate. So, um, I, I, but most companies aren't that different from other companies and they don't put the time and effort into thinking about uh, what their brands can be. They, they come up with these, you know, these just the platitudes of like, it's our desire to exceed every guest's expectations and be like, blah, blah, it's all, nonsense. Can't act on that. 
Very good. Are there any other questions? Well, we have Rick still. Well, I got either, one, I guess. Uh, what what are some I, of your, your current campaigns? What's that? Sorry. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, I, go ahead. I, good. I was just noticing the lack of questions, and I thought e either I've bored everyone completely or, or the information has been flawless and there's nothing left to be known. Far from it. I actually did want to ask you, was there any sort of like ulterior motive knowing that you'd be going on this grand adventure down something akin to the Pan America trail? An ulterior motive? No, I don't say it as a, as a bad thing. I mean, like you basically got paid to go on an amazing journey across, the, you know, down the Americas. I was just curious if you had that in mind when you... No. So, no. It was, it was on a, you know, we, we thought the best thing that we could do for Nissan was to show the romance and the versatility of this vehicle and do it for real, not fake anything. Of course. Um, and the adventure, you know, I don't know that I would have signed up if I knew that, that there were indigenous people that were, would chase me with, with swords because they thought I was stealing their soul. Oh, Jesus. Or, you know, or hanging off the back of a pathfinder with, you know, dysentery because there are no bathrooms and we got to keep moving. So, sure. but it was a, it was a huge advanced adventure. And that's one of the things about advertising is that, um, you know, you, you do stuff like you, you know, you meet your heroes and you go on adventure, you go on adventures and, uh, but it's all in service of the brand. You know? There was one time when I did, uh, I did book myself a trip to Hawaii. It, it, you showed the spot for Isuzu. And so I'd come up with a spot uh, for the liar where he s explains that um, all the vehicles are made by elves at the factory. And um, I really like the spot. Like it's clearly a lie and it would be funny to do the animation. And so Joe interacts with the elves and the client killed it. I'm like, damn it. I love that spot, but they want something else. Okay, Joe's on a beach in Hawaii. And so, and they bought that. So I sort of, um, that's one, one time in 38 years that I sort of went for, you know, for grins. And there was one time for Jack in the Box where the uh, uh, Screen Actors Guild was on strike. So no actors in the United States could work and we had a campaign to do. And so we said, all right, uh, Jack to try to up the quality of his food is touring Europe. And so we used uh, European actors and we shot in Italy and that was kind of, we shot at the, we shot at the Vatican. Like Jack went everywhere. Those two, those are two times when we sort of built in an adventure, you know, just because we thought that would be fun. And we had to because of a strike. Very good. So do most of you want to be in marketing departments or at ad agencies? Do you want to be account people and do relations? Or do you want to be creative people and create things? What do you think? We got some coming up here. One says ad, ad marketing, advertising marketing, looks like. Feel free to type it out. I know some of you are, want to do okay, a creative director. And there you go, another one. Yeah. You know, uh, so when I... When I worked at Shiat Day, I worked for Jay Shiat and a creative director named Lee Clow. Uh, if you don't know who he is, uh, look him up because he's responsible for Apple advertising. He would meet once a week with Steve Jobs and work out the advertising and Nike and all kinds of things. And Jay and Lee would refer, the people that they wanted to hire, they referred to as creative adults. 
So if you're a creative person and you are crazy because you're creative, that has limited value. Can't put that person in front of a client, can't have them risk like cursing out the client and saying, you know, you're all capitalist fucks and I don't need this. No, <laughs> but a creative adult, someone who can think strategically and creatively and be in a room with a client and uh, address the business problem and creative solutions, those are the people that go far in advertising. Are there any other questions for our, our guest today? Rick Siddig, again, from Secret Weapon Marketing. Can I tell you the story if you, uh, there, okay, there's a quick story about, so uh, for the first 50 years, I was Dick Siddig. Right. Okay. And so, um, you know, when I was born, Richard was like the seventh most popular name, boy's name in America. And uh, Dick is short for Richard, and that's what my parents called me. But over time, you know, that became harder and harder to live with. Every Judd Apatow movie just made it worse. And so uh, it all, it, it, and, and so it all came to a head when uh, I went to a meatloaf concert. 300 pound guy, stringy hair, operatic voice, 11 minute songs. I, I was a fan of Meatloaf because he doesn't look like a rock star and I thought he was a great performer. Anyway, so a friend of mine knows Meatloaf and said, uh, you wanna go to the concert? I said, yeah. And I, I knew every word to every song and I was with my peeps and it was great. And then she said afterwards, you wanna go meet Meat? I'm like, oh my God, he's my hero. Of course I wanna meet Meat. And so she takes me backstage after the concert and she goes, hey, me, uh, really, you know, my friend here really enjoyed your concert. He knows every word to every song. He's got your albums on vinyl and cassette and CDs. And, and um, anyway, he's a, he's a huge, huge fan. Uh, I'd like you to meet Dick. And Meatloaf said, what the hell kind of name is Dick? And uh, at that moment, I realized that if a guy named Meatloaf is giving you grief about your name, maybe it's time to change your name. And so I sent an email out to my friends and colleagues and, and said, uh, this has been a pebble in my shoe for a long time. So from now on, please call me Rick. And um, so that's why most of my career I was Dick. And then I figured out I need to rebrand myself and um, that was a, you know, a pebble in my shoe for a long time. But so anyway, that, that's, that's the ultimate branding story for me. Amazing stuff. And I found out afterwards, people would come to me and go, hey, I know you know me as Mike, but my real name is Francis, I had dozens of friends tell me that they had kind of a similar experience. All right, anything else or are we, are we done for the day? I think we're looking good now, Rick. Okay. So I um, want to thank you for sharing part of your day with us and I'm sure the students learned quite a bit from your experiences and your stories here. Well, I appreciate it. I, I enjoyed it myself. Thanks for the opportunity. And uh, good luck to all of you, whatever it is that you uh, choose to do. Be perseverant. Nothing comes easily, but um, just uh, keep at it. Uh, be differentiated and um, things will start to click. It really will. All right, thanks everybody. Wise words. Thanks again, Rick. Thank you. Have Thank a great you. night. All right, thanks everybody here.
Um, have a great night, everyone. Have a good night. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Thanks, Prof. Sir, uh, Prof, is there attendance for this? I'm about to use my Zoom information for the attendance, okay? I got, I got five different schools here, so. Oh, all right. <laughs> I'll, I'll go, all right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's okay. Don't worry about it. All right. Thank you, Prof. Good night. Corey, I'll help you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sharon. I'll help you with the with the list thing. We'll figure it out. Cool. All right. Thank you, my friend. See you soon. What a great presentation. My gosh.